to tune like a huge problem of the whole industry. Manuel mentioned that as well. Um, when talking about autonomous driving, it's quite easy to show a demo car, a show car, but to scale it up to a daily use, that's a big issue. And maybe our next company can help here a little bit. We welcome on stage now the CDO of Helm AI, key insights to making autonomous driving a reality. Please welcome on stage Tobias Vessels. All right, good afternoon. My name is Toby Vessels. I'm a Chief Development Officer at Helm AI. We are an AI software company in Silicon Valley. Um, I want to talk with you about autonomous driving. We've heard a lot of things about today, about simulations, unsupervised learning. The question is, where the heck are those self-driving cars? Uh, we have seen those examples 15 years ago um, when I was at, uh, working at Google. So why are there not more cars out there? Uh, it's a hard problem. Uh, first of all, uh, driving, autonomously is actually very easy, right? Especially if a beautiful day, if you have a closed highway or parking lot, uh, driving a car is, is easy. What's very hard is driving it safely. And the reason is when you look at driving a car, you run into things like accidents. And every accident is uh, an edge case, right? Here in Berlin, we have something like wild boars. And that's something that you don't expect. It doesn't happen, but it can happen. And so how do you need to train for this? So um, again, autonomous driving is one thing. Driving safely is, um, is a big challenge. Why is it so difficult? I can just train for those things, right? I can just train uh, for wild boars. And we have heard earlier in those conversations that uh, it's hard to train this because it's very expensive to train these systems. Let's look at some of those edge cases um, here and see what's happening so we've seen some examples in the press recently about uh, systems not recognizing small children, uh, other things. Um, we see cars flipping over. We've seen situations where there was a truck um, that was um, uh, aligned perpendicular to the driving way. And if you were to able to interview the underlying AI, the AI was saying, I, I didn't recognize this truck because you never taught me on this truck in this, in this situation. Right? Um, and in, the, in this case with children, say, well, I, I wasn't trained on, on small children, so I'm, I can't be to blame. And um, of course, we know when to break, because we are able to, to generalize certain concepts and to abstract and have an understanding, hey, this is a person or this is a truck, even if the truck is standing perpendicular to the driving road. So that's very hard for computers to do, to generalize and have an abstract understanding of the real world. You know? I want to look at some other examples here. There's occlusions, right? So it's not perfect data. We know, of course, hey, this is a stop sign. This, this truck is stopped. Uh, we know that this is um, a special truck um, that is, um, that's the back of a truck. And um, the computer system would say, well, I, I see a road here, right? So the same, same problems. I have these edge cases. Edge cases is what's causing those accidents, you know? And then you have debris coming down. Stuff that can happen. You have a ladder coming down, or in this case, a chair. And training now for chairs, you can do this, but then you need to train for toilet bowls that could fall down, a ladder, and other things. So it's very, very hard. It's a never-ending story. The long tail is what's actually causing these big problems. You know? so, so what does it take to enable not a system that allows self-driving cars, but actually self-driving self cars? And the question comes up, well, is it a matter of sensors? Right? Over the years, we've heard LiDAR companies, radar companies, we have new type of sensors. And it's probably not sufficient because if that's the bottleneck, I would just have a car with hundreds of sensors on it and the car should be driving. The question is, well, it, could it be software engineers? Right? Maybe I need to put more people behind it. Maybe instead of having 2,000, I need now 4,000 people who work on this. If that were true, then companies like Google who have um, tens of thousands of people should have solved this, right? They have uh, clearly enough uh, resources out there um, to, to solve for this. So that cannot be it. And then, of course, what about money? Uh, can I just, like, buy my way into this? And that is also probably not sufficient. 
And we have heard this earlier from some of the speakers that this annotation problem is very costly. I'll sp also speak to this. Um, we at Helm AI, we think it takes three things to make this a reality. And we can answer, uh, talk about uh, some of those next realities during our Q&A following. We think you need to have an underlying technology that is scalable. All right, so we all like technology. We believe that is an absolute uh, necessity. You also need large-scale validation data. There's only so much you can do in simulations. You'd be surprised about the craziness of real-life examples. So we think it's an absolute um, requirement to have live vehicle data. And last but not least, you need money. Right? So that's, that, that hasn't changed. Let's talk a little bit about um, how these nets work. So the explicit um, uh, representation of, of code is a program. Uh, the more abstract version is a neural net. Right? So um, uh, neural nets can be Turing complete, can actually replace any type of code. And the way to train these neural nets is that you uh, put in training data. And one way to do this in the uh, traditional way is you, you feed a lot of millions of uh, pictures into the system, say, this is a street sign, this is a car, this is what an SUV looks like. And then this actually generates a, a neural net. This is an a, uh, example we've heard about. It's called supervised learning. Works really well for expli explicitly stated uh, challenges. The problem is it costs a lot of money. So um, rates are about a euro, a dollar, nowadays a euro is a dollar uh, per frame. So if you train your system with 10 million pictures uh, to recognize an item, uh, it costs you $10 million. So if I want to expand this now to uh, new animals, well, that each object was cost you another $10 million. So that's actually verified. If you look at the um, self-driving cars out there, you'll see all of these car companies went through tens, hundreds, billions of dollars in funding. And all these new edge cases, if I now need to train for something, will cost me another millions of dollars. And then, of course, you have more edge cases and so on. So there's got to be a better way. Um, we have developed um, a technology uh, based on um, technology methods and math, uh, compressive sensing, uh, through our founder um, and CEO, uh, Vlad. And it's called um, deep teaching. It's um, related to unsupervised learning techniques that you uh, might have heard of. The challenge with traditional unsupervised learning mechanisms is that the rate of information per frame has been very low. So you're not achieving the same quality that you would achieve with supervised learning, which are very expensive. And so we've bridged this. We're actually on par with supervised learning mechanisms, however, running this through computers. OK, you're saving a lot of money. What's so new about this? Well, you're saving a lot of money, but we can also feed now a lot of data into the systems who then generalized and have a generalized view of, uh, of the world. So I'll give you an example. So you're a new car company, and you're, you want to you wanna expand to, to, say, Australia. right? And you're in Australia, and it's clear you have new types of animals. You have, for instance, kangaroos in Australia. And it is, although maybe not common, but it's a realistic example that you have a crash with a kangaroo, right? So normally, you would actually encounter those accidents and maybe encounter death, uh, death and you don't want to do this. With our system, we can take vast amount of animal data, which is uh, readily available. We train the system, um, and we can do this at low cost because we don't have this tax of human annotation. And now, before the system goes out there, to a new country, to a new um, uh, driving situation. Now the system is there saying, hey, I've encountered this before. So exactly like humans, when before you get in a car and make your driver's license, you have actually eight years, 18 years of uh, experience, and you know, hey, what can happen on the road, although you have never been uh, in a car. That's exactly the same model. Uh, what it means that if you look back at our training example, that we can use much more data. You want to use more data because it allows you to generalize much better, right? And it allows you to have better performance. So um, when you see some of these examples from, from companies that um, promise to enable autonomous driving, this is in, you know, on a beautiful California day at noon, the sun is, is shining and so on. Making these systems work in the middle of the night in Germany when it's raining is extremely hard. That's when those systems fail. And so this is where we shine because we 
um, we know how to generalize, and we can perform really well. We'll see this in some of the ex example. Most importantly, cost is going down while the performance is actually going up, and so you don't have this bottleneck anymore that you had before. No. So here are some examples. Um, when you compare examples, you also have to make sure that this is not a staged example. So this is a video that you are seeing. Um, in this example, we're driving um, a very challenging road in California. The car has never been there before. So it's not like we're just um, recording something and we're driving it off. The computer has never been there before. We're using one camera, one GPU. In production car vehicles, you would actually have multiple um, uh, CP, um, uh, GPUs, right, for redundancy reasons. Um, but we are not using any maps. Humans also don't need maps to drive. And um, again, this is a, um, a, a totally new, a, a new situation. And in this case, uh, the AI was only trained with arbitrary input data. So let's, let's see how this, oh, I, don't think we, I don't think the video was actually running. That's not running. Um, we'll see this, or you can see this later on our booth. Um, in this example, you'll see, uh, uh, recognition of, um, of lanes uh, in, um, in hard weather situations, uh, which is really, really challenging. Um, an another example is, how well are you doing to uh, now understand um, uh, objects that are coming down, right? Because that's really where you uh, compare um, supervised and unsupervised learning models. How, how um, uh, are you able to recognize, uh, let's see if this video works. No, we're not. It doesn't seem to be working. Um, you can see it at our booth. Uh, what we are showing you here is um, we ask the computer, tell us a drivable space, tell us where we can drive. And now you have um, a lot of edge cases that are happening. In this case, there's a moose running over the street. We have not, tra <laughs> we have not trained on moose um, before, but the computer is able to say, hey, this is an object um, that is not part of the drivable space, I pass this on to the computer who now says, hey, I'm going to break now, right? Training for these, uh, obviously, simple examples is very, very hard for the computer. And this is where we come in. So to summarize, deep teaching allows us to um, be much more cost effective uh, than human operated system, but be on par in terms of the performance side with human operated systems is significantly cheaper um, however, we are also be able to uh, generate performance at scale, be able to generalize and have very robust models. And robust models means that if you have a little change in the input, the model still works. And so you'll see this, for instance, when you have night driving or when you have some occlusions or maybe you have some dirty lenses and cameras. You know? So that's um, uh, what, we, um, what we do, what deep teaching means. Um, the applications are way beyond just autonomous driving. Um, and you have this actually in, in every situation when you have an input data um, that you need to make sense of it. Um, so for instance, we have partners who say, well, I have, a, I have a drone. It's very easy to fly the drone, but it's very hard to stay um, out of harm's way. We have people crashing now into walls, into trees. And so that's very hard because um, we then need to have, understand what is a tree, what does a tree branch look like. We perform really well, and so um, we have partners that work in the drone space, off-road space, mining, and so on. Uh, and the reason we can perform there is because the model is trained on much more data that is um, at par of human annotation today. So thank you for your time, and happy to take any questions if you have a few minutes. So yes, thank you very much. So I'll check, first of all, if there are questions from you guys. It's always you first, me second. No questions from your side. Well, then I will ask one. Um, you know that we have two main topics here uh, on Edge Shift Mobility 2022, and the second one is sustainability. So I'm always asking myself, how does that come together, autonomous driving and sustainability? What do you say? Yeah, uh, we actually see tremendous opportunities. Um, it's maybe not very intuitive, but there are um, a handful of factors um, how actually autonomous driving can contribute to sustainability, specifically lower energy consumption. So one point is, so if you think about autonomous delivery vehicles, right? And that might actually be one of the earlier ad adoptions of autonomous driving. Um, 
Um, so the energy consumption physically is a, um, is a direct function um, of uh, the mass of a vehicle. So if you're an autonomous delivery vehicle, you're saving actually a lot of mass. You don't need a cabin anymore, you don't need a heating system anymore. It's much smaller mass, so your ratio of packages to vehicle goes up. So you're saving many percent um, just because of that. Second is, um, now you have a human tax. These drivers need to drive very quickly because they're expensive. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the human tax, the vehicle can be a little bit um, slower. A little bit slower means that you have an over proportionately um, energy savings because you have less wind resistance. You're, you can operate in a more efficient speed envelope. It used to be something so small, right? Yeah, it's a huge the effect in the end is like enormous. That, that, that's right. And so, and the third point is. Computer systems will be much more efficient. They can drive in the optimal space. You're saving additional points there. And last but not least, um, autonomous vehicles, if you, if you neglect the fact that you have to charge them once in a while, you can actually perform 24 hours. Right? So instead of having two vehicles per day that are uh, driving, I can have one vehicle a day. So I'm saving at least 50% on the energy because I need less vehicles. So we think that these four points together probably give you another 40% of energy savings, even compared to an, a regular EV vehicle. You know? so, and I think that's, that's super exciting. Four very important topic points. OK, perfect. Let's check again. I one oh, one I have question. A question. It's maybe rather technical, but um, can you take into account time when you look at the, the pictures? Or is it frame by frame? Or does the car know what happens like 15 seconds ago? You know what I mean? In, in terms of to find out uh, which objects are occluded, for example? Yeah, it, it, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's this, this time aspect, so this dynamic aspect, is actually informing the model and teaching it um, literally new things. You know, so, you f for instance, um, the, um, if, you, if you're driving and now an object gets bigger, right? so you can now infer distances out of this, types of vehicles, and that's something that this um, neural net uh, learns by itself and informs it, and also situation, where is this vehicle compared to others? Uh, that's kind of a side benefit of this approach. And again, you want to use as much data as possible, which hasn't been um, previously possible because it's just so expensive, so you discard a lot of data. But now by using so much data, you can actually inform and understand, hey, um, uh, where's the side, where's this relative position? Even just based on, um, on monocular camera uh, data alone, absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Any further questions from you guys? No, then thank you very much, Tobias. It was a pleasure to have you here. That's your round of applause. Thank you.